So this is Medicine for Nightmares bookstore, clearly, obviously. You're in the right portal this evening. And uh, Tan and Josiah. You want to do an intro, dude? Or you want to talk about this or just? Can I, yeah, yeah I'm sure, man. Actually, you. <laughs> no, you can just. Well, you know. I, please, if I if I may if I may interrupt this uh, broadcast for a few moments, I want to say uh, bienvenidos to Medicine for Nightmares. Um, and also uh, say that this gentleman right here has uh, basically been doing a semi-regular Friday musical residency since we've opened. Uh, this gentleman here is part of our San Francisco soundtrack. This is, this is a, a person we feel real blessed to have here every Friday. And because of him and his energia, after the, the gigs that he does, when he just waxes poetic about all these beautiful things, Tan, came up with the idea of doing a, a lecture series based on you know, Bay Area musicians coming in and talking about, talking about those things that they love. So uh, this is the beginning of uh, uh, the Musical Medicina series that we're starting, and uh, David is doing this, this talk tonight, and he's also, next month, he's doing the talk on Rosh Hashanah and Kirk. So it's a big deal. It's a big thing having him here, so por favorcito, give it up for Mr. David Boyce. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that, like, I, I do this all the time. Like, you come hang out with me, this is what ends up happening. We just listen to music and probably smoke a bunch of weed and, you know, like, talk about music. So, um, as distinguished as the word lecture sounds like, I wouldn't necessarily call this a lecture. Um, but there's some stuff that you may or may not know about Sun Ra that, um, you know, <clears throat> I'd like to fill you in on. And also, if you don't know who Ra is, um, you should probably know, because he's, he's one of our great American artists. Um, so, show of hands, who, who knows Ra? We just gotta do a little quick, a little, a little quick, quick catch up. Who does not know who Sun Ra is? You don't? That's it? You're the only one. Okay, so check it out. That's Sun Ra. He was born Herman Blunt in Birmingham, Alabama in 1918. He was known as the weird person in town. He would often be walking the side of the road in like brightly colored robes. He always read, he was a fixture at the library, lived in the library, and he was a musician, played piano and a bunch of other things. Completely freak for Birmingham, Alabama. Like not, shouldn't have not been there. It was almost dangerous for him to be there because people would fuck with him basically. So. He ended up in the army, tried to send him to World War II. He was a conscience objector. He was in jail for a moment because he refused to fight. All right. Got out of the army and started to play music in nightclubs in Chicago. And uh, you know, he'd always played, you know, and was very talented, could play. And he ended up being Fletcher Henderson's musical director. Um, Fletcher Henderson was the architect of uh, swing so-called swing jazz music. His big band in the late 20s, early 30s, was the first, um, you know, swing big band, basically. He invented the genre and wrote arrangements that Benny Goodman played. In fact, you know, uh, some of Benny Goodman's hits were written by Fletcher Henderson. So, um, but this is Fletcher Henderson in the 40s, so he was kind of, you know, on the back end of things. But Sun Ra was his musical director. So Ra got all that music, you know, um, uh, experience. He arranged for the band, wrote for the show. It was still like they would do all these extravaganzas where they'd have like dancers and singers and stuff. And Ra would write all the backgrounds and stuff as well as play the arrangements and direct the band. So um, he was obsessed with large ensembles. He hated small bands. He wanted the band to be huge. 20 people plus, bam, you know. He wanted that sound. So uh, on his own, he started to rehearse um, his own ensemble. So, and after a while, he had written enough music to have a big band. So around Chicago, they were known as this kind of underground big band, but Rye had another thing going. He believed he was from Saturn. And uh, we we'll talk about this, talked about uh, his abduction. He claimed he had been abducted by aliens. And there's a couple accounts of that, um, you know, uh, some interviews he talks about being taken and, and, and told things and taught that he needed to 
you know, tune up the people of Earth with music. So um, he started to, uh, you know, really lean on this idea and use the band to express that idea. So you would get, you know, you might hear something that was a conventional big band arrangement of, you know, a standard, and then the next song would be called like, you know, Out of Darkness There, and it would be like this crazy tone poem with the oboe in the lead that nobody was writing like that in the 50s. You know, he was the first person to play an electric keyboard in the so-called jazz context. You know, there's Wurlitzer all over a, a record called Sun Song, I believe. So, and he was always forward thinking his idea about using technology and stuff. So, fast forward, uh, He gets to New York, and of course, he gets to New York around 1960, 61, where New York is blowing up with the whole art scene. So he becomes you know, influenced by the arts, and the orchestra actually lived downtown uh, in the Lower East Side. Um, so he was smack dab in the middle of that whole thing that was happening with the artists. Um, you know, the whole arts movement, dancing, first coming in, you know, the whole, the painters and everything, the whole jazz scene. And uh, firmly became a part of the so-called jazz avant-garde, which at that point was, uh, you know, the, the talking heads or the people that paid attention, right? They knew Ornette Coleman, Cecil Taylor, John Coltrane. So, um, and Rob was, you know, firmly in that pantheon of people who were trying to push the music away from, you know, or not push the music away, but just, you know, the music was advancing in a certain way and they definitely were going that way. Some other people were doing some things, they decided to do some other things. But that's how it is in art. There's always traditionalists and then there's people who like want to use their own imagination. And it's, you know, it's debatable whether or not, you know, I'm not gonna get into it, but Rob was thinking like outer space basically. So the band would go out of space and he's, you know, credited as, well, he's not credited as, but he should be as someone who more or less invented the happening, which later became a happening, like, you know, a kind of audiovisual, you know, circus of sensory overload dancers, light show, visuals, music, you know, like, and all of it just interacting, you know. Rob was doing this in like 60, 61, so, you know, uh, dancers, band always rolled with at least five or six dancers, you know, and they were featured prominently. Like concerts would last like three, four hours a night, you know, like they just would not stop. They had a Monday night gig in 1968 in a club called Slugs in the Bowery in New York City. And they would drive, John Gilmore in an interview, John Gilmore is his, his tennis saxophone player, one of my favorites. He would say uh, they would rehearse five or six hours and then, and then uh, drive two hours from Philly to New York to the slugs gig and then do that, you know, and then like drive back to Philly at like, you know, six in the morning. And like they did this every Monday for like six, eight months, like it was not a thing, you know. So Rob was on a mission, basically, and he wanted to tune up, you know, um, the people of Earth with his music uh, and music in general and sound. So, uh, so literally, so that's Sun Ra in a nutshell. Okay, now that he's caught up, um, we can do this. Uh, any questions? Y'all do? No? There's a record called Astro Black. You should listen to it. Yeah, there you go. That's a good way in. Sometimes uh, rock can be a little difficult for some folks. Me and Lala were talking about how, you know, you clear rooms sometimes. Um, but. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you give it a chance, uh, there's layers of enlightenment there, so to speak. So that's the thing I always, um, when listening to abstract music, you know, or trying to get people to listen to abstract music or look at something that's not, you know, the norm, is that just, you know, you gotta give it a chance. You have to kind of suspend your need to, you know, be a certain way for you to make you feel comfortable. You know, raw will make you feel uncomfortable, you know, 
because I think he might have been uncomfortable at a point. So, and that's all good. We're all uncomfortable, but uh, you know, <clears throat> he represents an openness to things that you don't really see too much, you know, anymore. You know, but we'll, that's a whole other discussion. But so, one of the things he was open to was technology. He was a big, you know, sci-fi movie fan, so he dug, you know, all the them. He liked the monster movies. Them, you ever see them? The ants that come out of the, in the L.A. freeway. It's an awesome movie. Um, Day the Earth Stood Still. That was that was one of his favorites. Uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, War of the Worlds. You ever seen that one? Gene Barry. That's a good one. Uh, I used to watch these when I was a little kid in the '70s on television because they would show these. You know. I grew up on his kind of sci-fi, so it was cool. Uh, so Rob was a big fan of those movies, and uh, they became sort of absorbed into his whole um, oeuvre, so to speak. And uh, he felt, you know, he was very firmly, you know, in touch with the now of the space age, you know, jet planes, so to speak, right? You know, we got NASA is about to happen. And so he felt like humanity is going there, so we need to go, you know, full steam ahead. And uh, so he embraced electronic instruments. And, and like I said before, he's one of the first uh, to actually just use electric piano in a scenario where it would normally be an acoustic piano. And he had a numerous keyboards, uh, later on that he would play um, on stage. Um, I'll show you a picture. All right, so if you look at that, <clears throat> kind of hard to see. This. <clears throat> so that's a Farfisa, which is an organ that was made in Chicago in the early 60s. It's known to be used in like surf music you listen to the ventures, stuff like that, like the really weird kind of uh, heavy vibrato organ. Um, not quite a B3 because the sound's not that thick, but there's still, you know, there's, there's a vibe to it. Um, Fucking said they made many different kinds of models. Um, I don't remember what this model is offhand. I can find out. This is a R RMI Roxacord electric piano, which is uh, sounds like a clavinet, which is the funk keyboard player, that her, uh, keyboard that Herbie Hancock, Bernie Worrell, people, whack, 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 whack. Stevie Wonder, Superstition, right? That's a clavinet, all right? So, so you've had these sounds in your head forever, right? So this is just, you know, a way to connect them, right? So, so and he, Ra had a clavinet as well too, which is probably over here, you can see the rest of the keyboard set up. And then on top is the mode synthesizer, which is the reason why we are here. Right. Um, so synthesizers, the first commercial synthesizer was invented by Robert A. Moog, M-O-O-G, right? We have, you know, and you've probably seen the Moog on the back of keyboards forever, right? Going to concerts, you know, the keyboard player might have a Moog. He might have a mini Moog, you know, or something like that. Uh, uh, Moog became a business, I think, in like 66 or something. And he started to produce uh, synthesizers, analog synthesizers. And Ra was taken to his studio in 69 by a writer and uh, either purchased a Model B, which is what that one is, um, or in Moog's, uh, in his, um, documentary that came out a few years ago, uh, there's a little snippet in there where Moog says he actually, he lent, he, uh, he lent Ra a Model B and never got it back. <laughs> yeah, and every time he tried to get it back, Ra was like evasive and started talking about the stars. And, <laughs> and Moog was like, can I just have, it? it's a prototype, can I have it back? And Ra's like, you know, the otherness of there is now. And, uh, yeah. But, so. However he got it, he ended up getting one. And uh, I think it, um, whatever the sounds that he was hearing in, in his head, um, they seemed to be really channeled through the Moog. Um, 
They had to move from about 60, 69, 68 until 78. They moved to Philadelphia in the 70s, Germantown. And um, the house that they were in uh, was broken into. And apparently all the keyboards were downstairs, excuse me, all the keyboards were downstairs in the living room because they used to rehearse downstairs. So the thieves took whatever they could grab and they got, I think they got the rocks accord, which is heavy. I don't know how the hell they grabbed that. And then, but, but they took the Moog. So if you listen to his music after 1978, it, it's, it's uh, not necessarily um, the space music anymore. And I think, I think this is a theory I have, but I think it's because um, you know, he didn't have the Moog. I think the Moog was his main you know, instrument to get through to the ninth dimension and like other other synthesizers just didn't really do it for him. There's a, he had a Krumar, a digital Krumar Italian company. Um, and it sounds great, it's in that movie. Uh, if you've seen this movie, actually if you haven't, actually it's a really good, good one, it's called The Joyful Noise. Are you hip to this? Yeah, exactly. So there's a, they're playing on the roof and, and those of you who've seen the movie know that there's a little part where Rod, it's this little snippet where he's taking a, a a synth solo, and the Krumar is the keyboard in, in that scene. It sounds great, but there's just something about the Moog, I think, that really inspired him. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so when that keyboard was, was stolen, uh, I think it was kind of the end of an era. Um, or he just, you know, decided to find other ways to get to space, but they didn't necessarily involve, you know, the, the synthesizer. So, uh, yeah, that's... So yes, yeah, 69, so the first examples of, him playing, or you know, the recordings were on a, uh, so this is a record called My Brother the Wind. There's a volume one and there's a volume two. And uh, volume one has four pieces that were recorded when he went to uh, Moog's studio to buy uh, that first synthesizer in 69. Yeah, um, he apparently obviously got to play around with it and, and they recorded these four little bits. So, uh, and it's interesting to listen to them and we'll listen to a couple of them. Um, because, uh, well, we'll just listen to them. I think the thing to remember about Sun Ra, or what I have come to understand, and I'm trying to figure out why he, I keep coming back to him after not listening to him for a long time, is that for me, um, the whole exploration thing is just really attractive. This idea that, like, is the frontier, and you need to go on a you know on a journey and try to figure out what's happening. You know, is there life on other planets? Is there understanding here? Is there anything that we can take that will you know improve our lives? You know, so. And Ra talks about uh, that's a central to his philosophy, and I think it's uh, there you go. This is called Bantam. Oh, that's the other one. So I got the idea to do this, or just at least a thought about um, you know, Ron never really had a third party subsidy, you know, like the institutions grant makers, people like that, you know, that kind of started to happen for him a little bit later on in his career, but for the most part they did stuff because he was just like, we're going to Egypt. And, you know, the band was like, okay. And it just happened, you know. So they, they kind of just, that's how they were rolling for a while. But, um, you know, the, the, the folks that are subsidized and therefore enter the canon and then, you know, and it's nothing to take away from these folks because they're brilliant artists, more than Sabatnik, you know, like, Gershon Kingsley, who, you know, programmed, you know, for Ra, the mini mode. You know, these 
they're great. It's not like they're not great, but it's just like, Ron's cool too. So that's one of the first things Rod did. Um, let me just get the sound a little bit better. Sorry, I thought. All right, let's backtrack for a second. That's such a typical, beautiful Moog sound. Hear that? And it's suddenly beating together, and that's what people love. When they talk about the warmth of analog synths, listen to that. It feels like it's breathing. You're in upstate New York in this tiny little town, Trumansburg, this tiny little factory that employed about 30 people in all. Most of the people, as we call it, stuffing circuit boards. And imagine the thrill for them that bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were buying the Moog synthesizer. It was just amazing. And there, the musicians played a crucial role. He had a studio musician who's a guy at Cornell called David Borden, who formed the first ever live synthesizer ensemble, Mother Mallard's portable masterpiece company, now you can just call it Mother Mallard, who was had a little duck on stage with them. And um, Dave Borden was a studio musician, and he would work with Robert Moog, refining components for the synthesizer. I was only there a few days, and I noticed an electronics burn smell in the air. And I, yeah, Bob came down, and he was only there for like, maybe five seconds. He looked at it and he said, holy, you know, and I thought, oh, well, that's the end of me here. And instead he came over and, and put his arm around my shoulder, which he never does to people. He gave me a key and he said, 
Just stay as late as you like and, and don't worry about anything and leave it set up. Don't worry about cleaning up after yourself. Just leave it set up the way you do. So he, I did that for six months and then I knew what I was doing at the end of six months, but it took me that long. And, he, and Bob knew it too and he came and he talked to me and he said, in the process the last few months, we've redesigned all the modules so that no matter how they are hooked up, they will not fail and they won't burn out. So that's my, uh, that's my contribution to the research of the Moog synthesizer. I was idiot-proofing everything. The legacy of Robert Moog and the synthesizer is, is you know, if I'm, if I'm going to be a little bit over the top, is, is all electronic music. He's interested in what can electricity do for music? How can we make electricity musical? That it's not an artificial sound for him, it's what electricity does. And he's exploring all the different ways in which you can get modified waveforms and filters and so forth to, to create this new world of, of pitch generation. Bob Moog said electronic music instruments and musical instruments in general are the most delicate interface we have between human and machine. So designing one that's a success like Mo did, it's incredible he could do that. I mean, he had a lot of luck. He had a team of engineers helping him. But there's got to be something in what he did that no one else did, that putting it all together that, um, is why we remember the name of Mo and why people love him so much and great affection for him as I do. So, yeah, I just wanted to so that, <clears throat> just so that, you know, you understand where Mr. Moog was coming from. All right. Nineteen seventy was a good year for them, uh, for the band. Um, creatively, uh, and they went to uh, Europe on a European tour, and it got documented quite a bit. There's all sorts of nice little um, pieces of film from 1970, 71. There's some good stuff from when they were in Egypt too. Um, and this is a uh, we're gonna watch some of this because it's as, as it's actually it's pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of raw footage on YouTube, but a lot of it's from the 80s. So it's nice when there's something from the 70s that shows up. Um, uh, uh, Cause you just, it's, you know, it's just a different vibe, that's all, you know. It's all good, trust me. The 80s stuff is not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not like it's bad or anything. But uh, there's just something about, 1971 is just, there's just something about 1971. So uh, this is a, a little half hour little situation. Um, we'll watch a little bit of it, but it's one of the few times where um, I don't think there's any other uh, film documentation of Ra actually playing the Moog like a solo. So this ends with about three minutes of him. I mean, he's about to get busy and then it fades. It's painful. So, uh, so I just want to warn you when you watch this, because you, you know, you watch and you're just like, it's one of these moments where you're like, what are you thinking? Like, they're filming, like, seriously? Like, you know, like, why would you roll the credits now? You know, or if they decide to edit it. But this little, um, it's like a, there's a series of films called Jazz Session. And they were produced by this guy, Bernard Leon, French dude. And um, I have a couple of them. There's an Ahmad Jamal one you may have seen. And it's right from around this period as well. And it's like, 35 minutes long, and again, you know, like they're just about to get cooking, and then like the credits start to roll. So, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what's up. He had enough money for <laughs> half hour of, you know, film, and then that was it. Um, but there's some really great documentation of people, um, artists from that era through this little jazz session, you know, uh, video series. So if you see them, they're like these little, they're black and white, and they're just really, really excellent. So this is, uh, this is um, this is the Sun Ra one, and uh, we'll watch a little bit, and then um, we'll watch the Moog solo at the end. And uh,
Le mage sonnera est sur le plan de l'anecdote un des plus mystérieux musiciens de jazz actuel. Il a volontairement brouillé des pistes pour que l'on ignore son véritable nom et sa date de naissance. On sait seulement qu'il fut un temps le pianiste de l'orchestre de Fletcher Anderson avant qu'il nommène à Chicago, puis à New York, une carrière souterraine de chef d'orchestre. Ayant groupé autour de lui une quinzaine de fidèles, il a enregistré pour de petites marques confidentielles des disques qui sont le reflet de tous les styles de jazz qui se sont succédés depuis le grand orchestre de Dizzy Gillespie en 1941. La mode, aujourd'hui, étant à la musique libre et ouverte, et pour les Noirs américains une réactivation des danses et rythmes ancestraux de l'Afrique, Sonra a mis en scène un spectacle où s'entrechoque à mi-chemin du hasard et du bonheur des dizaines d'influences furieuses. Voici quelques images de cet assez prodigieux cocktail de musique et de civilisations exotiques.
So cause it goes on for a moment like that. It's 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 wonderful, and I urge you to sit and watch the whole thing. But um, all right, here we go. See what I, I'm, I'm, you, 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 <laughs> you're not gonna anyway. From an ar archival standpoint, I'm glad we got that, but I'm just like I know there's like another 45 minutes of that concert, so it would, be, it would really be nice to like see the rest of it. I'm gonna log off here because I forgot my hard drive. I think we should listen to some music. Okay, ready? 
because I really, you know, I can't talk about this. You, you, you just got to hear raw. It's, 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 so, um, I was bored one night, and I decided, you know, let's see if how many synthesizer solos I can find out of all the digitized raw I have in my in my archive. So I went through, and I found forty solos. The either it's just the Moog or it's the Moog and the Farfisa and the Roxica, whatever you had on stage, right? It's, 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 and there's, I, I, I gleaned about what is this, 34 of them. So there's four hours and 22 minutes of um, Ra freaking out in my phone and on my um, uh, hard drive. And actually, it's also online now, too. There's a Rootstock Radio. It's a, it's a streaming thing arts thing that my friend set up and it's up there too so if you want to listen to it I, you, you can go up there um and uh it's a pretty crazy selection of music um and it's absolutely wonderful so i think we should listen to some of it and uh um you don't need to look at the computer anymore uh, I'm done. All right, this is called Space Probe. So this was recorded in that batch that went on the My Brother the Wind record. Um, but it has come out on a British label called Art Yard by itself. So, but I've seen it through, uh, the authorized raw label on uh, what is it what called evidence? No, what was it? What was it? Remember they came out in the nineties. They re they reissued a bunch of raw records in the nineties. Anyway, it's a label. I've seen it on that too. But anyway, I'm just being a nerd. Um, uh, so this is called Space Probe. <laughs>
Obviously, you know, synthesizer music um, during that era, clearly. And he wasn't, you know, the only one. But the way he was manipulating the instruments, very different from what was being recorded by uh, Wendy Carlos, uh, who was Walter before um, her transition. Um, and, you know, like I said, Sabotnik and um, some other folks. Um, they have a very... Uh, I'm gonna choose my words wisely here. Uh, there's more order to what they do, but even then, see, that's even that's not really right. Uh, okay, I'll say it this way. The sound design aspect of it was, I think, pioneered by Sun Ra. Um, what you just heard was, you know, like no one played the synthesizer like that then and not even really now, you know? I mean, it's, it's like that's some prototype noise music, you know? Um, and again, if we listen to, here, I'll play Morton Sobotnik a little bit, and this is not to, you know, downplay Mr. Sobotnik, but this is just, you know, this is what folks were utilizing the, the synthesizer for prior, you know, another example. Oh, I have four butterflies. All right, here we go. So this is Morton Sobotnik's uh, Moog music. I think he played a Moog, or maybe it was a Bukla. But it's an analog synthesizer. And 
that too is a wonderful piece of music. I urge you to check out. But Rob was kind of freaking it in a way that other people really didn't do. And he really liked that noise. Uh, uh, there's a noise um, knob on a Moog, most analog synthesizers, where you can just phase in some shh. And this became a whole like universe unto himself you know, when he would take these solos, like the noise and he could, you know, conjure noise out of nowhere. It's pretty stunning. Let me, let me, let's, let's listen to one where it's. One that's not so long. Here we go. This is from Cleveland, a random concert in Cleveland from 1973. So that's an example of noise, the noisy synth. Uh, so these will come they usually would be, well, from the tracks that I got them from, they seem to come after large uh, you know, group collective solos and the band will break down and then it would become an organ or a keyboard solo. 
And then, so um, to kind of, to take them out of context, it's interesting because they haven't, like, if you listen to the whole track, they have a different sort of, um, there's a different emotional kind of thing that happens, um, you know, because you can hear the whole narrative of the track, you know. Um, but when you just take them alone, um, you know, the, as their own thing, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, let's listen to one more where they're, it's coming out of the ensemble. Let me see. Uh, Rob was really big into, you know, theater. <laughs> And he had a very dramatic, melodramatic way of going about things. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's an example of the Moog, like in an ensemble setting. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that was uh, Astro Black off the record. So there you go. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think the Moog offered him quite a few avenues for expression. He would talk about how um, the instrument had great capacity for feeling, which is interesting because we always get this, you know, people talk about how, you know, electronic music is not, you know, it, it's devoid of, you know, human feeling or it's cold, right? I, that, that's been an old cliche for it, right? But, um, you know, he felt like that wasn't the case. He felt like, you know, these instruments, you know, it's all about how you apply, you know, your humanness to them, you know, um, to get out what you need to get out of them, you know? So, uh, and it, for me, you know, having listened to this stuff and listening to that, you know, a lot, quite a bit, and, go, and coming back to it in periods of my life where, like, you know, I need something that makes a little bit more sense. So, you know, uh, we'll listen to some stuff that's a little bit more, you know, it's not a difficult listen per, per se, uh, or a challenging listen, I should say. And then you come back to this and it's like, you understand, you just, you start to be like, okay, the, the possibilities for, you know, for expression are really, great if you allow yourself to, uh, you know, to consider what hasn't been considered before, right? He was big about the unknown. He would always say, uh, you know, it's, you need to know uh, about the unknown in order to survive. This is like a paraphrase of a quote, and in, in, it's in the Robert Muggy movie, um, in the beginning of the movie. And he's saying that, you know, he, he's, his whole thing is that like, we've tried, um, we've tried the known, and it doesn't work, right? So now it's time to, you know, try the unknown. So, you know, and to have, you know, relinquish the plan, a friend of mine used to always say. Um, and yeah, Ra completely relinquished the plan, uh, you know, um, but seemed to be in control. Because it's interesting, because I don't really know, and I haven't really come across any explanations uh, about whether or not he knew what he was doing if he turned, you know, the VCO mod knob and some sound would come out. Like, you know, um, he seemed to be, you know, he seemed to be a person that spent a lot of time with the Moog and, you know, and, and knew what was going to, you know, happen with certain combinations of turns and stuff. But still, it's, I don't really know because he gets a really varied amount of sounds out of this thing. And uh, if you listen to, like, if you listen to this playlist, it's not, you know, it's not repetitive in the sense that he makes the same sounds over and over again in the same order. Each of these pieces, they're real compositional. They have, like, beginnings and middles and ends. And, and dare I say, with all the cacophony, they're actually really musical. You know, you can actually, like, listen to them, especially, like, the two and three, four-minute bits. They're really, they're fascinating. They're, their whole world's under themselves. The four that were recorded... When he went to go try out the Moog, um, you know, the the longest one's like 434 maybe. And it's like, it's just, and maybe he's mining two or three sounds. It's not, they're not these complex soundscapes, right? They're just these little melodies. And they're just, they're amazing. You know, they're little compositional little gems. And he's in, he's out, bam. And they all have different sounds, you know. So my guess is he would, you know, turn the knobs to a certain sound that he would like and then improvise on the keyboard. And that's another thing too, so, he, so the, the Moog has a keyboard, so it's real, it's, 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 uh, it's monophonic, which means it only makes one note at a time. Polyphonic is more than notes, right? So a polyphonic synth, you can play chords and songs on, but a monophonic synth, you just got that, you know? So um, the, uh, the, the, the other folks are using modular synths, um, which, you know, they're, uh, they have the patch bays. You've probably seen them, like, it, they look like big lab things, and, you know, people are patching sounds, and um, Gershon Kingsley, Wendy Carlos Williams, they were using the Moog, that Moog, that, that type of Moog, Model 10, I think it, it was called. Um, but, you know, Ra, his thing is more keyboard-based because he was, you know, a keyboard player. Not that, you know, obviously Wendy Carlos Williams, she played Bach, so she could play, but he was coming from a more, you know, keyboard-oriented thing. So that's why the Moog suited him. Um, and uh, what was my point? Uh, monophonic, monophony. I have a senior moment here. Uh, what's my point? What was I trying to say? Oh, 
I was trying to make a point about the differences between a modular synth and when that's played with a keyboard. So the point being that uh, perhaps you have a little bit more of a leeway in shaping the sound in the moment with a keyboard related instrument um, than maybe the modular. You know, modulars usually sit the way they sit and then that's how they're dealt with, you know. But Ra was big into action, you know, like a knob turn was an event for him, clearly. And, and so it, 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 he kept things moving and organic in a way that some of the other synthesis didn't. It was more of a kind of like, like if you listen to Stock Hines, uh, Stockhausen's synth music, it's, you know, um, it operates in a slower kind of thing with gradual increments, sounds and filters changing. And, you know, he's very mathematical about it. If you look at his books, you know, he's got everything worked out and the knob will turn this much. And then, you know, the arpeggio, it's, just, it's very, it's very, it's very, it's, it's very, you know, an orderly type of, of fashion where I, as clearly Rod, Rod's just turning knobs, you know. Um, so there's a sense of like, okay, well, he's just turning knobs. Like it's, anyone can turn a knob on a synthesizer, and which is true, you know. And um, but when you listen to the, when you actually listen to this stuff, like there's 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 a control there that becomes pretty apparent. You know, this is not it's not you know a random exercise. You know, it's they're definitely improvised. He's not writing any music down, um, but it is not. Uh, it is not random, you know, there are decisions being made in the moment and, uh, and he has control over these sounds and how to get them, you know, um, and only he would know, we would have to ask him. Um, but there, there is no evidence. I tried to read some interviews and, and, and he wasn't really, he wasn't really thinking about technique in the European Eurocentric kind of classical music way of technique where, you know, you're a virtuoso and you've done the practice and, you know, technique for Ra was more about, um, you know, getting that sound out in that moment, you know, the way you might think you want it to sound, but maybe what you hit is better than what you want it to get at. So, you know, and it was more of, uh, it's more of an intuitive based kind of approach to um, the instrument, you know, or just in, in sound production in general. So, yeah. Uh, I'm about to wrap this up. I think you guys are probably done with me talking. Uh, but I'll play one more piece for you, though. Um, and I hope you enjoy this. And there'll be other people doing this, so it won't just be me. <laughs> and, uh, Although I volunteered to do the first two because um, I like talking about Sun Ra and I also like talking about Rassan Roland Kirk, who's also another genius. Uh, okay, so um, let's listen to one where Ra is playing all of the keyboards at once. Like the last little bit of that video that was so unfortunately phased out by that horrible engineer person. Which, Okay, this is called uh, Let's listen to the Salutations from the Universe. Yeah, let's listen to that one. This is live at the Gibbous in Paris. This is also a really good record. There's a couple of really good synth solos on this one. It's well recorded and the band sounds great. Um,
night, every evening. Good night, my friends, until tomorrow morning. <laughs>
Good salutations from the universe. So um, thank you for hanging out with me and listening to some crazy ass music. I much appreciate it. And uh, go listen to some Sun Ra if you have a moment because he's great. So, um, Do you have any questions? Sure. I will try to answer some. Yeah. So, Sun Ra's Fletcher Henderson musical director. Yeah, when he was a young man, like we're talking like the late 40s at okay. the end of like the, at, you know, at, so the swing was over with by that point, but some of the older big band um, guys, they were still kind of holding on, trying to hold together, a, you know, because Economically, it was hard to hold together a band that was bigger than 15 people. It, it always, it, it, I mean, it always has been. So some of these people started kind of dropping off, you know, and, and, and the whole big band thing was kind of winding down because it became about, at that, at that point, it was all about small combos. Um, Bebop had come in and that kind of made the small group palatable. So this idea that, you know, we're going to go to the ballroom and dance to like, you know, Tommy Dorsey or Glenn Miller or Don Redman or Jimmy Lunsford or, you know, any of these, that was kind of gone, basically. So, thought you, uh, so they had a gig at the Hotel De Lisa. So they were basically ensconced in a hotel. So it, they weren't torn or anything. It was like they would just kind of go see Fletcher Henderson's orchestra at the Hotel De Lisa, da 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 kind of thing. Almost like a Vegas kind of vibe, you know, so. So did he get struck by lightning or something? I mean, do you know, it, is there anything in his life story that shows how he separated from that very physical swing action into oh, that? Oh. electron space? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he was always hearing different things, I think. And so by the time the band got to New York, that was it. They were, they were like, it was like that, you know, and... Most of the other big bands at that time didn't really sound like that at all. They still don't sound like that. And they certainly weren't sound like that at 61. I mean, it was more of a, you know, we're reading arrangements and Raw had things like, a lot of that, it sounds like cacophony, but if you, if, if you watch a concert, he's conducting. He's like trumpets, you know, you know, saxophones, he's doing this shit. He's like, and there's hand motions, you know, this is like a space chord and he'll just do this shit. And the whole band, they might be playing a passage that's like, you know, it might be a line, and he'll just turn and just do that, and the shit will go postal. They'll just start collectively, you know, like, it's just, it becomes noise, basically. And then he'll just, he'll just look at people and, you know, it's just a rhythm section, you know. So a lot of that is like, when you listen to it and you don't see it, it's like, you know, like, what the hell is going on here, you know? But it's really like, it's, you know... It's, it's very orchestrated, or parts of it are very orchestrated. And then there's, there's a couple films where uh, they're in rehearsal and they're going over eight bars of music. Like he's just, you know, looking at them like counting it off, two, three, four, da, 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 da. You know, and he'll stop it. What is your note? G, and he's a play, play the F, you know? And then it's, so it's very, you know, it's got this, it's, it's everything, you know? It's, and sometimes they would rehearse something for like three hours like the, the Slugs gig, right? I was telling you about before. They might rehearse four or five hours before that, right? And it might be like a rehearsal where like, you know, we're hitting our, you know, we're hitting our points. This is this, da 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 da. They're all playing it right, you know? And then they get to the gig and he doesn't call any of that music, you know? He'll give them sign for a space chord and then the rest of the night is just, it's on, you know? And then, but they will not have played anything that they rehearsed, you know? And they talk about that a lot. You know, like been in the folks in the band, yeah. It's just like you know, he's ever. It was just you know, he was whatever was in the moment. I think he was one of those persons that was really, excuse me, was really in the moment, you know, and was uh, kind of obsessed with having this thing happen that wasn't necessarily dictated by like you know any kind of direction per se, you know. So. Um, and that might have a lot to do with the fact that, you know, I mean, he thought he was from another planet, so he, he, he called himself a different order of being. So, you know, so he definitely was thinking, you know, this is how it goes on my planet, you know, like, you know, I might be, I might be here on Earth, but I'm not of Earth, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah.
so he was always constantly moving, I think, toward abstraction and this idea. I think he associated noise and abstraction with like, you know, the, the, the whole jet age, the 21st century, like, you know, we're moving from, you know, things were accelerating, you know, at that point in time. So I think he, uh, you know, uh, I think he wanted to be of the times and of, you know, as well as being of past times, he wanted to be of future times, you know. He, I think time for him was, you know, spherical at best, you know, so, yeah. Did, uh, did the stolen mold never show up again anywhere? No, I, not that I know, I mean, no, because after that, he, it's interesting. So he got that Krumar, um, which is in the Robert Muggy movie. And then, uh, and then in the 80s, he has like some Yamaha DX7s. He's got some really weird digital things, but he doesn't, he doesn't go back to that sound. Like there's never... But that specific, uh, that specific little machine never showed up. Nah. Mm -mm. Again, nobody, uh, Gone. Said, hey, it's Who is Bob Muggy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no, just, 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 yeah, someone stole it, probably fenced it, you know, like, they broke it, I mean, he lost a bunch of keyboards that, that, he lost all his analog keyboards in that, in that house robbery, yeah. so that kind of shut down a whole sound environment, like, they took the Farfisa, they took the rocks to court, like, they just cleaned them out, basically, so, you know, and that's when you start, you start ending up with these, you know, early 80s, digital synthesizers and keyboards that kind of try to mimic the analog sounds of the previous era, but not, they're like their own new digital thing. And I don't think he was feeling it, you know? Cause you can see, like there's one concert where he's playing the DX7, he's just kind of looking at this thing, you know? And he, it's, and he sounds great, but like he starts turning the knobs on it, or, or actually he's got these little press button things, right? And you can tell like, he's just like, it's not the Moog, it's just like this weird, you know, Yamaha thing, right? You know, so not to denigrate Yamaha, but you know, he just it wasn't it wasn't the same thing. So I think there's a whole, uh, you know, in the '80s, he, the band started moving toward like this uh, Fletcher Henderson neo swing kind of. You know, they did uh, a Disney record, you know, they, they did a bunch of songs from Disney movies, and it became more like, you know, a traditional big band, you know. Um, and, you know, kind of reined in a little bit from the wildness of the 70s. You know, the 70s are like open territory. The 80s became real revisionist, even for him, which is obviously not revisionist, but like it was as revisionist as he was going to get, basically, you know, which is understandable because a lot of the jazz in the 80s had gone back. It was the Wynton Marsalis era, so everybody got, you know, everyone got their panties in a bunch in 1983 talking about the tradition and, you know, we're not playing enough standards and all this stuff. So, and then like, yeah, these, you know, younger folks coming in and, you know, they were like real jazz people. So it was, you know, the Blakey Blue Note thing, you know. Um, but even then, during that period, you know, like he might play some Fletcher Henderson songs, but there's gonna be some 86, 1986 space music in there because that's just who he is, you know, so. You know, Mr. Mahali. Stuff on things, mm -hmm. so you advocate yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's like communicating or attempts to communicate or being communicated with. It's really compelling. It, it's yeah. exciting and it, some of it's anxiety producing in a way of being in a fast vehicle. It's like the sound is a vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you 100%. It is a vehicle. They're very exploratory for me. Like when I listen to them, you know, if I sit and I listen to that playlist, I almost. So I had it on when I was driving the other day and I realized, mm -mm, no, this is not gonna work because, you know, like I was starting to speed a little bit and like, you know, not paying attention to shit and, you know. <laughs> so I put Ahmad Jamal on just so we could get home yeah. safely, 
you know, but yeah, but you're right though, for sure. Like I feel it, it's, it's, it's very physically journey music in, in a very sonic kind of way, if you can say that. Um, yeah, vehicles, yeah. Yeah. Did you talk about that in any poems or anything, what sound you would do? I should have brought the immeasurable equation. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's gotta be something. Um, yeah, there's probably some there's probably some chant or something about that. Yeah, I mean I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, uh, yeah, it was bad. Yeah, yeah. I think it happened in '78. You know, yeah. Um, and you know, when you lose, you know, obviously when you lose instruments, your focus kind of you have to adjust to what you know you can get with you know. And he started. He went back to playing a lot of piano in the '80s. There's a, there's all kinds of. There's all kinds of great, there's a solo piano set from Venezia that's awesome. You know, it's brilliant, you know. Um, and there's a lot of that in the 80s. So, you know, it, 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 yeah, I mean, I like the space music personally, but, you know, it's cool. The 80s were raw. It was good. It was a good time for him, too, because, like, they were able to make some money for a change. And, you know people started to like fly them around a little bit more. So they didn't have to scramble so much. So um, it was actually, you know, it, it was a good time for Cause he had a stroke in 89, 90. And that was pretty much the end of him, like, you know, playing. I think they had, uh, they were taking him around for a moment, like in the wheelchair, it was crazy. Um, but it, it, they stopped that pretty promptly. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And hey, again, thanks for hanging out, and uh, much appreciated. Yeah. And yeah, please patronize the spot because it's dope. Thank you, Tom. And uh, there'll be many more speakers, not just me, in this series. So please. Uh... Oh, and also tomorrow night, uh, I curate and perform at in that corner or sometimes over here um, with various friends of mine and various groups. So tomorrow night I'll be playing duet with Evelyn Davis, who is a remarkable piano player. She lives right across the street, actually. And we're going to play duets, probably acoustic duets, so I won't bring any of the crazy machines. It'll just be saxophone and that piano over there. Ooh. <laughs> or maybe not that <laughs> piano over there. Oopsie daisy. Yeah, okay, well, um, something will work out. We'll figure it out. But yeah, anyway, that, that, that's just going to happen. Uh, so thank you again for coming to hang out and listening to Sun Raw. You guys are awesome to go on that sonic excursion. I know it's a little crazy people music, but we need it. So thank you. Thank you.